Thanks for coming today, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about communicating in a hostile environment, which I would say is right here, right now, today. If I was a totalitarian government, this is one of the first places I would be. Um, and then also about protecting your sources. So we're going to try to make this really practical. We might get into um, some examples, but really hope that you can leave here with tips, tools, and some techniques to make you and all of your colleagues as well safer. Uh, super honored to have Corey here with me. He is quite a prolific author, 20 some books, is also a reporter. Uh, my favorite are Little Brother and Homeland, if you haven't read them yet. Um, and I am chairman and founder of three organizations right now, um, Wicker Foundation, uh, the Roots Asylum, and co-chairman of Wicker Inc. And um, Little Brother really, um, how many of you have read it? This room. All right, oh. wow. Uh, you know, my favorite thing about Little Brother is, is it was entertaining. I couldn't put the book down, but I learned so many lessons, like technically accurate lessons in that book from Corey, some of which we'll talk about today, not only why, you know, what you need to do, but why you need to do it. And a little bit about my background is um, I've been lucky enough to be educated by the very best hackers in the world, um, helping organize DEF CON for over 15 years. And six years ago, I founded the kids' version of DEF CON, which is called Roots Asylum. And so, um, you know, I didn't really start out as a paranoid or untrusting person, um, but I think when you've learned lessons that I have from hackers, um, you change your mind a little bit. Um, and so just really quick before we get into tips, just want to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the things that we teach the kids. Uh, for instance, um, two years ago, we showed all of the kids how to eavesdrop on all of your cell phone conversations, your text messages, your usernames and passwords coming off your phone right now. How many of you are connected to the Wi-Fi here? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, but I guess the point of this is, is this is not NSA level stuff. We taught the kids how to do this with a $500 femto cell in a backpack. Um, so surveillance has really gone mainstream here. One of the other things that we taught the kids how to do that I see used against journalists quite often is turning on your interfacing camera. Again, this is not NSA level stuff. We had several kids find zero days in the Samsung TVs. Um, there's millions and hundreds of millions of them all over the world. And you could turn on the interfacing camera without the light coming on. Uh, the same thing can happen on your phone and on your laptop. Um, so in the back here for you, one of the things I've got are some fancy removable stickers. Um, you know, I think this is something easy that you can do, is have those, covers ca those cameras covered when you're not using them. It's not going to be, um, not going to take you that much longer um, to do. So, and we'll get into some more tips. Um, but what I think is just really important for everyone to know, we've had a lot of talk about the NSA lately. And from my experience, this is just the tip of the iceberg. At DEF CON every year, I would guess that we have about 70 nation states that send spies there that are learning all the new exploits and vulnerabilities that we teach there every year. Uh, so this is not just the NSA. And uh, one of the things that I find most interesting is that um, we've had to kick out numerous journalists uh, who we found out were actually spies. Um, it's a really great way to do research as a spy because journalists have reason to come in and ask questions and ask people and, and, um, and be a little bit more nosy and confrontational than you do otherwise. Um, so, you know, this is something that happens all the time. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the, the movie uh, 1971 that Laura Petraeus just produced. Um, but in that, too, uh, that's how they infiltrated the FBI. They started by sending in someone to act as a journalist so that they could see the inside of the FBI location that they wanted to steal. Um, so I wonder how many of you here are spies, actually. Well, you all should be spies, or at least we're going to try to teach you some spy techniques today, um, because I think what we've now learned over the years is that, um, like I said, we are in a hostile environment every day, and you, you need to protect your sources, and we're really going to have to up the game in terms of the technology that we're providing here. So with that, we'll get into some of the tips, and we'll get Corey talking a little bit more. 
Um, and, but before we do, I have to say just that no security is 100%, right? Even me, um, it's pretty paranoid. There's no way to be perfect. So if you're trying to be perfect, it's easy to say that resistance is futile and you might as well give up. Um, but that's not really where we need to go. Um, I spent a lot of time in Tahoe and um, got a lot of bears up there and have a little joke. We say, well, how do you protect yourself from a bear? You just run faster than your friend. And I think all of us can imagine having just a little bit better security than the other people out there. And by doing so, it's kind of like having the club on your car. It's not perfect, uh, but usually the thief's going to go to the next car at this point. And so it's really important just to be aware of the digital footprint you're leaving online, and we're all going to make different choices. I don't have any pictures of me up on the internet yet with my eyes, and that's kind of the extreme version of it. But just with everything you do, think about the digital footprint that you're leaving out there. There's a, a real issue in the move to use biometrics as authentication tokens, your fingerprints, your, your retinal patterns, your gait your speech, uh, and so on, which is that none of these things are secret, and uh, none of these things are easy to keep a secret. When uh, there was a chancellor in Germany who was pushing for fingerprints as a biometric identifier to be used in, in a national ID card, so the Chaos Computer Club invited her to a, uh, a panel discussion from which they lifted her fingerprints off her water glass and then made 10,000 sets of them and bound them into a nationally distributed magazine. Uh, you may have seen that in the Office of Personnel Management hack yesterday, they admitted that 5.1 million fingerprints were stolen from the database uh, by presumably, I think the presumption is these days that they were Chinese spies, but who knows who, who, who took those. Um, and of course, the problem with, with breaching fingerprints instead of passwords, where those fingerprints are used in place of a password or as part of a, an authentication system, is you can, you can invent a new password. Uh, but once your fingerprints are out there, and by definition your fingerprints are out there all the time, uh, the, um, they are uh, impossible to recall or change. Or if you want to be a criminal, what you can do is just go ahead and put all of your fingerprints online and put them out there, and then you'll have plausible deniability. <laughs> I guess there's that too. <laughs> but that won't help you if, you're, uh, if you work for an office building where they use <laughs> fingerprints uh, as, a, as a login or an authenticator. Um, so we talked a little bit about covering cameras and mics, and like I said, they're, they're everywhere out there. I don't know how many of you uh, on your way traveling here passed one of those new Nest uh, commercials that's going on all, all the airports, and you can see everybody's house and what everybody's doing, and they're pitching that it's for security, um, but they're usually using some kind of, of uh, wireless connection there that's pretty easy to get into, um, so even your security cameras can be turned against you. At DEF CON this year, uh, there was a suite of attacks against baby monitors revealed, 10 different top model baby monitors, which I think they, they were the 10 that the researchers picked more or less out of a hat. I don't think that they found a bunch of baby monitors that were great, and then these 10 ones that were just badly secured. And they were all networked, and they were all ownable over the internet. They may have had encryption on the video, but the, their own security was so poor that uh, you could get into the video before it was encrypted or you could get it to dump the, the encryption key. Uh, so one of the things, things that I think it's really important to be doing, and especially for your kids and your loved ones as much as for yourself, is hide your locations. Um, especially as you're talking, about, talking with sources or about sources or places that you're going. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that right now. And I think a lot of people, if you've, um, I think one good example of this is Instagram. Um, with Instagram, you can tell alone by where people are posting from, it's usually their home. Uh, so all of the Olympians that came home, we could tell where all of the gold medals were. Um, uh Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. One of the things that computers are exceptionally good at is spotting differences in patterns. And so um, it, uh, with a lot of these security measures, Consider, depending on who your adversary is and when you, when you model out who your adversary is, it, it is nearly as insecure to suddenly take a security measure just as you're doing something sensitive as it is to, uh, um, to do nothing at all when the sensitive occasion arises. If 
uh, your source and you decide that you're now working on something really um, intense and that you need to worry about, and all of a sudden your locations disappear from your Instagram, uh, then knowing what happened just before your locations disappeared from your Instagram is, is itself a very useful fact. So um, a theme that, that should be going through your mind now is anticipating what happens in the event that you suddenly have a reason to fear not an untargeted opportunistic attack, but a very targeted attack, is what you're going to do now to establish the pattern that, that um, will not create a break when you suddenly become secure. There's other good reasons to do that. I, I think uh, Nico said it earlier when we were having lunch that um, if you have nothing to hide and you're lucky enough to have nothing to hide, uh, you are surrounded by people who you love and care about who do have something to hide because they, they, didn't, they didn't win the lottery that says that everything about your life is a, could be an open book without any reprisals against you. And if they're the only ones keeping secrets, um, then, uh, then it's pretty obvious who the people are with something to hide. So we provide cover for everyone in our lives by, by having good privacy hygiene. Um, that includes future you. Right, uh, the, the people who may have something to hide is, is you in a year uh, or in a month or in a day. And so the way that you protect future you who may have something to hide is by taking good past, uh, privacy uh, measures now. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ways you can be tracked in a minute. Um, I think one of the other ones that's really important, this is more, I guess, from a personal standpoint than necessarily as a journalist, um, but protecting your birth date and birth location um, so Alessandro Acquaziti was able to take a low-res, high-security picture um, from one of the cameras and connect it to your social security number using Facebook and Match.com. And because most people have put this information out there, and with those two pieces of information alone, they have a very high accuracy of being able to get your financial and healthcare identity. And um, so those are two things if you have done and you have them out there as well as your locations and a lot of these stuff. Uh, what you can do is provide misinformation and there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, I often will gum up Google by searching for chainsaws. Um, you put in the wrong birth date, wrong birthplace, wrong location into Google Maps. If I'm going to use Google Maps, I might, might go a block away before I get in and drop myself off a block before. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways out there that you can, you can add misinformation out there. I'm a little more skeptical than Nico is of how effective that is, because computers are pretty good at finding patterns. And so it's very, hard to be, it's very hard to be consistently false. If there's one thing that's true more often than everything else that's genuinely random, then um, the, thing, the thing that you answered five times in a row the same way is much more likely to be true uh, than, than all the ones that you varied every time you were asked. And so it's, it's very tricky to do this. And one of the reasons it's very tricky is that um, we have institutions that require this information on a routine basis. So if you have a, a child in school in Burbank, where I live, um, you have to give your date of birth to the, no doubt, incredibly well-secured Burbank School District. Uh, and so it, it's, it's quite a problem. Um, it's also a problem where you spoof that information, where you have the opportunity to spoof that information. Um, you don't know how that's going to be used as a challenge question. So you may bank with a bank that says, tell me what your favorite sports team is and your date of birth and your mother's maiden name, none of which are very hard to look up. Uh, about you, and so you may come up with random numbers or random strings. I, I, I do this routinely. I'll just have I have a file where I keep track of what I told them. I what random string I said was my favorite sports team. One of the problems that you'll run up against if you're if you're deploying that as your as a means of sort of chaffing the system, is that your bank, like mine, might ask you your challenge questions as a series of bulleted uh, possible answers. So they may say, "What's your favorite sports team? The Bengals, the Tigers, the." Blue Jays, the Orioles, or the random string, uh, at which point it becomes really obvious which one your, your high security question was. <laughs> uh, same thing, I can never answer my bank security questions because I've, I've put misinformation all out there, so sometimes it's difficult. Another thing that, I, that I've done for a long time that probably was not good is so many places force you to give their social, your social security number, right? And so I was just making up social security numbers. I didn't really realize in doing that I was kind of stealing someone else's identity in a way, right? And so from now on, if you need to make up your social security number, start it with 666, because they don't start social security numbers with 666. You can, you can also, you can, um, 
Google random social security numbers. There are, there are programs that will, because social security numbers have checksums. They, 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 the numbers mean things. And so you can come up with ones that are plausible as well. Uh, the social security number for the principal and little brother actually does give you someone who was born the same year that that principal was born in San Francisco, which are two of the things encoded in the social security number. Uh, this is one you guys probably already know, but I would say it's also vice versa. Don't put your sources in your contact book. I usually store them in multiple separate files, not saying source contact information uh, that's encrypted. Um, but then you also need to ask your sources to do the same thing. It's usually kind of on the other end um, where it's coming back and getting you. Um, it's a pretty simple thing that's easy to do, um, but we see a lot of mistakes happen there. And, and Nico brings up an important point, which is that um, security is a team sport, that if you keep your email very, very secure, but you correspond with people who have much worse hygiene, um, then the things that are uh, um, potentially risky to third parties in your email can breach from their end instead of yours. Um, I maintain my own mail server, but everyone I correspond with uses Gmail, and so Google still has a copy of all my mail. Which is actually, that's one of the reasons um, that I founded Wicker, because a lot of my friends had had their emails breached, but it wasn't because their security was bad. It was because Stratford had messed up, or one of the other big companies had messed up, and now everybody knew every contract they had and every amount of money they had. And so you might trust your friend, right, but you don't trust their security. And so by having something delete itself automatically off your friend's phone was, was one of the key reasons that we started Wicker. So Wicker is a messenger that, like, like Snapchat, but with, with actual working technology underneath it, deletes uh, messages and images and other files that are sent along, not because you don't trust the party you're sending it to, but you, do, you, you trust them not to have robotic perfection in remembering to delete the stuff they shouldn't be hanging on to. And so it's a, it's a way of, it's a way of um, using a computer to remember piddly mechanical stuff for you, which is the thing computers are really good at. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about tracking, because I think this is something that's really important. You know, there's a couple ways that you can have off-the-record conversations. Um, usually you think about going and meeting with someone in person, right? But you've got all these ways that you can be tracked out there from your license plate to your transit pass, um, your magnetic stripes, the GPS, RFID, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Most of these you can turn off. Um, um, back in the back of the room when you leave, I've got some Faraday cages that you can pick. I would grab two of them if I were you because I keep one in, my phone in one and the other one is my wallet. What this is is a, uh, is a metal cage. And it's a metal cage that does not have a seam, so it'll actually stop GPS, which is pretty amazing. And, and then Corey goes, well, yeah, but if you just, if you only use that metal cage when you go to get your source, then all of a sudden you've thrown up a flag, like, oh, they must be doing something. I'm like, yeah, well, I just put mine in there all the time. What's the bad part about that? You won't get a phone call, right? <laughs> um, so, but again, so I just put mine in there randomly. When I go into the shower, I'll put it in there. When I'm having a conversation, I know I'm not going to answer the phone, I put it in there. But if you put your phone on a timer that turns itself off every day at 1 o'clock and back on again at 2.30, um, then uh, if in one of those 1 to 2.30s, you have a meeting with someone uh, that is sensitive, it won't be as obvious as the fact that two people uh, who had been corresponding by email uh, in, in encrypted wrappers that nobody could read, uh, both turned off their phones at the same time and then both turned them on at the same time. Even if you don't know what they were talking about, the, the inference that they were talking is a really easy one to make. And so again, if you're worried about future you being someone who has something to hide, the way that you can provide cover for future you is by having good hygiene now. Uh, and same with keeping all of your email encrypted and so on. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that, that, that uh, are kind of recurring narrative tropes about how people can have good operational security that when you actually think about them as an adversary who might have access to all the phone records in a country or from a mobile carrier, um, immediately become obviously really dumb. Like if six people all go out and buy burner phones and then only talk to each other with them, and then you imagine the network graph of all of the phone traffic in a country, right? There's a bunch of people calling each other. There's a bunch of people who all call the pizza place, but the pizza place doesn't call out. There's a bunch of people who go to the phone booth and they all call out and no one calls in. And those are all patterns that are like instantly recognizable and the whole thing looks like a giant hairball. That's, that's your nation's 
telecoms. And then you have these like ringworms, these fairy rings of, oh, these six phones only call each other, and these six phones only call each other, and these six phones only call each other. Whatever it is they're doing, it's really obviously not like what every person who is a normal human does. And that immediately makes what you're doing incredibly suspicious and, and targetable. So again, um, much better than having a, a special set of practices that you do only when you want to be secret is to have all of your practices have good hygiene. Anything else you want to say about those, yeah. any of those tracking devices? I mean, they, they're all, yeah. Well, so you could, that's one thing you could do is you could, you could use burner phones with everyone. That sounds like a pretty expensive and labor intensive <laughs> way of doing it. I think if you were like, I think we have to differentiate between the threat model. If your threat model is that you are being incidentally discovered through mass surveillance, that's a different threat model to you are under direct suspicion. So Edward Snowden probably uh, has, if I were, if, if, if you were Edward Snowden, you might say it would be worth throwing away your phone every couple of days and getting a new one. If what you're worried about is uh, being incidentally discovered through mass surveillance, what you may do is use your regular phone to call everybody, but um, use as your default the most secure ways you have of communicating with those people. So uh, encrypted chats and encrypted voice where you can find it and so on as your default way of communicating with people, particularly um, things that are um, uh, um, to the extent that you can determine end to end so that, that no one in the middle can know what's going on or where it's directed. Now it's hard, right? It's hard for you to be a security expert and audit the source code of all the apps that you have on your phone and know it. But there are, there are some tips at least that you can use to figure out not whether your phone's app is end to end, but whether it's not. So if you look at your phone's privacy policy, at the privacy policy for an app, you, you may see, you'll always see like, what do you do with my data? One of the things you may see is um, we do nothing with your data because we can't access it. Or you may see like we got a, um, a, a camera, a networked camera, burglar alarm camera that had, a, that had a motion sensor and would send data to your phone. And I'm not qualified to audit the source code on that camera either, but in their privacy policy, it said, what do you do, with, who can see the video from my phone? And it said, we carefully vet which people in our company can see the video from your <laughs> camera in your house. Well, it, it tells you something important, right? That, that this is a camera that's designed uh, to be intercepted by third parties. And once you know that there are two p possible ways of designing cryptography, one is that you protect it between you and the company and then the company and the, your, your, your counterparty in your communication, the other one is that it's protected from end to end, um, then you should be looking for signs that things are end to end, that, the, that they don't, um, that, that they're not designed so that third, any third party can intercept them because if no third party can intercept your communications, uh, then no third party can be tricked or inveigled or leaned on or, mm -hmm. or threatened into divulging your, your communication. So that, that, that's, a, that's always a good tip off, is looking at the privacy practices as disclosed. Not because the companies are always truthful, but because their compliance officers are thinking about lawsuits down the way when they have a breach. The other thing I do is look for the under 13 clause, because uh, you can usually tell immediately what they're doing in their privacy policy, uh, what would, they're doing with your data. So it's a good way to speed, speed read and look at that part first. And then usually you could stop right there and not download the app for the most part. And one thing that said that Corey said about end to end that I think is really important for us all to know is I feel like there's a lot of companies out there today that are saying they use end to end encryption, um, but they've really abused the term because end to end means between your device and their server. That's end to end between two computers. That's very different than end to end between my device and your device. It's, it's like all you can eat, <laughs> but uh, but within reasons that within reasonable bounds that we set by saying all you can eat on this tiny plate, you know, or in 15 minutes or whatever. It's a very big asterisk next to end to end if what they mean by the other end is us, as opposed to the per your, your counterparty in your in your conversation. I'd say, and most of the end to end I see out there is end to server. So um, so beware. And I think with uh, with license plates. Um, um, Puking Monkey uh, did a study last year at DEF CON where he showed that we were tracking license plates. I guess there's a spray that you can put over your license plates that'll stop tracking. Um, with transit passes, you know, buy cash, buy one right there, don't use your regular transit pass. 
Um, and so, you know, with Faraday cages and these cameras, and, um, you know, camera covers and all these things, you're not too paranoid. You know, a couple years ago, I would, uh, would give these little removable stickers to, um, to all the journalists and they're like, oh, I had it on, my, um, on there for a while and then I felt really dumb and paranoid so I took it off. And you may remember, but many, many journalists have now, this is, this is an attack that happens quite often. It's a great way to compel someone not to do a story if you've got naked pictures of them in their bathroom. And I've seen it done. Um, don't take sensitive data through border crossings. Um, I'll let Corey talk sure. a little bit more about this, but before, um, before we do, I'll give you the solution. Or if you are going to have to take data through, um, which sometimes I do, um, but usually even on a burner phone, uh, we've got another really high-tech solution here, which is you cover it with colored saran wrap and then put branded duct tape over it when you're going through security. So that way, at least you're going to know if someone messed with your hardware, but you can still use the device. So I'm worried about a much different threat model, which is that you don't have, uh, you can be legally compelled at border crossings to surrender the password to your encrypted laptop. Uh, and um, it, it hasn't been very extensively litigated. Uh, it, in Canada, where it was used to catch pedophiles who were bringing images of childhood sexual abuse over the border, um, it wasn't the kind of case where you were going to get a good uh, result saying, no, 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 people do have the right to keep their passwords private. Um, and, and as a result, it's absolutely the best practice to assume that any data that you cross a, an international border with will be copied by the uh, border agency and may also, you also may be forced to decrypt it. There's, a, there's another risk, uh, which is that if you have to surrender your, your devices at a border that they, they may be returned to you with malware infections. Uh, the um, uh, state of Bavaria in Germany was caught using uh, what they called the Bundestrojaner, the state's Trojan, which was a piece of targeted malware where they would wait for people that they, that they were hoping to surveil to cross the border, and then they would confiscate their laptops for a secondary inspection, and while it was out of their sight, they would put a Trojan on that could operate their cameras and microphones, as well as harvesting their keystrokes and files covertly. Uh, and they bought that kind of as an off-the-shelf piece from one of the major cyber arms dealers. And so, in general, you should not take a piece of equipment with, with sensitive data that could compromise a third party across a border. And um, if your laptop or phone is taken away from you at a border, you should assume that it's compromised. Which maybe is a good thing to do. We'll talk more about using bugs to your own benefit later on there. But, uh, you know, if you, if you want to know who's surveilling you, maybe that's a good way. Um, I'd asked earlier about uh, who here was using the Wi-Fi network, and uh, I would say that um, I rarely use a Wi-Fi network, but especially in a place like ONA, uh, this is a great honeypot, right? I mean, look at all these journalists here in one place, 2,000 journalists. And um, even if you're using a VPN, that's not going to stop malware from getting on there. Um, and, and so, but I say choose carefully when to use Wi-Fi and MiFi because one of the things that I tell activists in hostile countries where the government has a deal with the cell phone carrier is go in and use a public Wi-Fi, go into to a coffee shop, use a public Wi-Fi, send your encrypted message and get out of there quick because even just an encrypted message alone is enough to, to, to say that you're guilty. So at least then again, you have a lot of cover and time around you in that case. Um, but even today, I would say, you know, a lot of times we talk about usability versus security. Um, but I would say MiFi is actually more usable and more secure in general because now I've got my wireless connection everywhere I go. I don't need to get the password. I just carry it around everywhere, and this guy's connected. So, um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. But, uh, but again, you need to think about your threat model there and what it is. I would say also Wi-Fi versus MiFi. It's a lot more illegal. To, to sniff a cellular network than it is to sniff Wi-Fi, or actually it's not even illegal to sniff Wi-Fi, but um, there's a lot of, of legal ramifications there on MiFi, and MiFi is more, um, you'd have to do more of a targeted attack than essentially coming here and getting all 2,000 of you at once. So to, to be clear, when we say that there's a risk to connecting to a public Wi-Fi network, even if you're using a VPN, it's not that the VPN will leak. It's that your, your operating system may have an, uh, an unpatched vulnerability that, can, that is targeted at, at your operating system, is used to attack your phone, your laptop, 
uh, uh, through that vulnerability in the way that it handles Wi-Fi packets. Um, those vulnerabilities, they're called zero days. They're, they're vulnerabilities that are, that are not known to the vendor. They're very expensive. Companies pay a lot of money to get them, and then they weaponize them and sell them to governments. And um, using one, deploying one in a, in a forum with 2,000 people might, might lose you that, that vulnerability. They, there's, a, there's only so many of them to go around. You have to wait for a researcher to find another one before you can use it, and a Wi-Fi one would be very valuable. But depending on your threat model, there, it is quite worrisome. In terms of a drive-by attack, Nico's right that the equipment needed to do, to, to do Wi-Fi eavesdropping on unencrypted communications is really cheap. It's just it's any a laptop you buy for a couple hundred dollars at a, at a used computer store with the right software, whereas the, the equipment to um, eavesdrop on cellular phones, much more expensive, much more specialized, and, and scarier to own. Uh, you know, beyond cryptography, which I'm assuming all of you are using by now, um, you know, add layers on top of it. So even if you do trust your cryptography, you can do things like, like teenagers do. Right? I don't know if Pig Latin's really it, but there's, there's one way that you can talk in code, right? Use code words for your files and your sources and your names. And, you know, drug dealers know how to do this all the time, too, right? Um, but I think it's just adding another layer on top of the encryption and, and crypto that you're already using just um, makes it even that much more difficult. So I think it's good to have other names that you can use to talk about people, but you also have to remember that, that the more complex your s operations are, the easier it is for you to slip up. And so mm -hmm. while it would be great to have a different code name that you use to talk to about a source with your editor versus a travel agent versus a collaborator, um, you know, you, you don't want to get into a situation where you have to keep lots of pieces, pieces of paper around. So I, I would not do this. I don't do this, and I, uh, and I wouldn't do it, because for me, it feels like that's the kind of thing you have to keep lots of records of to keep straight if you want to use it in any way. You do keep way. lots of records of it. That's also a great way to tell where a leak comes from. That's true, so. if, you can, if you can do the record keeping. But it true. is, uh, yeah, it's definitely adding a layer that's, uh, that's more if, complex. If you saw the piece that was uh, uh, written by... Um, uh, Laura Poitras and Heinrich Molta in the New York Times on uh, the collaboration of AT&T with, with um, the NSA. Uh, the documents that they showed uh, in that leak, they, the uh, NSA had different code names that they used to, to refer to their partners in, in surveillance, the telcos, that they used when they talked about them internally, when they talked about them with the FBI, when they talked about them with other entities. Um, and it was, uh, you could see in those docs that they sometimes were, were confusing themselves. It's a, it's a hard thing to keep track of. So I'd say maybe for a few very important ones, yeah. um, it's simple to keep. I think one of the big ones that we've seen are, are, that are more uh, familiar where, with now is this idea of watching out for your metadata. So even if you're using PGP on email, I can still who, tell who you're talking to, when, and how often. And as we've seen, this can be almost as or more telling than the actual information of the message itself. It's, um, so if there was someone that I needed to communicate with about uh, something very important where we were working on something and we didn't want to create uh, extraordinary events that showed when the tempo of our work was increasing, uh, we might establish like a heartbeat, like, like emailing once an hour during business hours, whether we needed it or not. That would just be a PGP message that just said, this That's is great. the hourly message. Um, and, and that uh, at least doesn't show how your tempo is changing in terms of your work on the story. That's kind of misinformation. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's more on the lines of having a, having a regular, like a routine pattern, rather than, having a, rather than trying to become random. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for humans to be random. We really suck at being random. You know that they had to change the shuffle algorithm in iTunes, because when you hear a song twice in a row, your intuition tells you that it's not random. Uh, where, of course, random things are not correlated, and so you sometimes get the same thing twice in a row. One of the ways you can tell if people are fiddling their taxes is because when you ask people to make up a bunch of numbers, they're not very random. Uh, and so you can look at the randomness in their ledgers to see whether or not they, they're, they're making stuff up. Um, being anonymous is really important. Um, and I think here what I would say to all of you just is, I think, from a, from a public policy perspective, this is one of the areas where your profession can really support the importance of this. Um, I think activists are the other group where this is really important. 
Um, you know, you get the other argument of this, which is it allows you know the four horsemen, drug dealers, and terrorists, and to uh, to hide. Um, but it's also really important for freedom of the press, for sources, and for activists. Um, and I think what we've seen recently here is that it's it's also really important that you verify your keys. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Is sure. That um, so uh, the, the great risk when you have good encryption uh, is that um, your adversary will find out uh, what, your, will find out what your, your key is and will intercept your messages, re-encrypt them, decrypt them, re-encrypt them, and send them on to, to your counterparty in a way that's hard for you to detect so that um, you and they may end up um, uh, communicating uh, in such a way that everything that you're that you're sending and receiving is being intercepted in the clear, but it seems to you that you're having a very secure conversation. So the traditional way of verifying uh, keys, especially in email, uh, is to use something that's not email. To assume that if your adversary is inside your email, maybe she isn't inside some other path, like a telephone call, a voice call. Um, we use uh, with with email. We use a thing called uh, dual key cryptography. That's where you have a key that you keep secret and a key that you share with the whole world. And that makes it a lot easier to do key exchange because instead of the problem being how do you make sure that only your counterparty knows your public key, you just have to make sure that, that your counterparty and anyone else who cares to can verify your public key. So one uh, uh, thing that is widely used and that I do is to put the fingerprint for your key, which is a short phrase that your key can be boiled down to, that a human being can read aloud on the phone or verify just by looking from a piece of paper at a screen, is to put that fingerprint in your Twitter profile. Um, Twitter has historically been very good about uh, resisting incursions on its users' privacy, and to the best of our knowledge, has never been forced to alter a user's profile uh, without their permission. Um, and having your key on a key server and its fingerprint on your Twitter profile lets anybody in the world download your key from a key server. There's a bunch of them, the big ones at MIT. And if you use PGP, that'll be the one that it probably defaults to. But then making sure that you and your correspondents go and ver verify your, um, your uh, key fingerprints using some third-party service that you trust not to, not to be perfect, but not to be infiltrated in real time by like ninja super spies who, as soon as someone wants to check whether a key is right or wrong, goes in and changes it briefly and then changes it back before anybody notices, which is, as far as we know, not an attack that anyone's doing. So it makes, it makes that kind of validation much easier. You can also validate over the phone. Uh, remember, this isn't a secret, right? The key is not, the, the fingerprint is not a secret. You just want to make sure that it's the right one. Um, so you can validate over the phone. You can, uh, if you have a newspaper, uh, you can publish your keys in the newspaper. You can publish your, your fingerprint in the newspaper on the masthead um, for, uh, for uh, each reporter or for uh, a general inquiry email box. Um, and that gets you a long way because, again, the attack that your um, adversary has to do in that event is figure out which of your readers who's getting the printed paper is likely to leak a secret and somehow swap every paper she gets with the ones that have the, uh, with the, the, ones that have the faked fingerprints. And that seems like a, transcendent, uh, a, a transcendently hard attack to imagine. So I think that's, that's probably a safe bet. An easy one, only send secrets to people you trust. Um, Let's talk a little bit about avoiding bugs, Corey. And a lot of these I, I learned from your book, and I think some of the work you've done. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to maybe talk to about some of the people you've worked with, and well, I think I, I think all of these are good advice. I mean, uh, if you look at the Freedom of the Press Foundation's resources on on surveillance, um, and also uh, Pat, who had to run off, who's giving a presentation tomorrow morning, uh, handed me this from the uh, Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. They've done a, a report on documentarians and the threats documentarians face called Dangerous Documentaries, which I think is a free PDF. And the second half of it is all resources for people who want, to, um, who want this kind of thing, operational security, very practical operational security tips. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has a thing called the um, Security Self-Defense Kit. And uh, it's a set of kind of, play, they call them playlists. Uh, for different people facing different adversaries. So if you're an LGBT kid living with uh, very strict and intolerant parents, here are the five things you need to know. If you're a reporter, here's the eight things you need to know. If you're an activist in, in uh, a country without the rule of law, here's what you need to know. So um, those guides are very good and very practical. I think all of this is, is, is good practical stuff. Um, hotel safes, 
uh, and, and hotel rooms both seem to be uh, overrated by travelers as places where their equipment can live without being molested. I mean, we know for a fact that, that there is a huge pool of not very well vetted people who have access to your hotel room, right? There's the, that's the um, if you think about trying to keep a secret, uh, when lots and lots of people know a secret, it gets exponentially harder to keep. One of those secrets would be, where is the pass key that gets people in and out of hotel rooms? And so that, that secret's not very hard to find out. Hotel safes, um, some people just recently published a, a, a breaching method for hotel safes that takes less than a minute and uses, I, I think it was like a pen barrel. Uh, to get into hotel safe. So definitely don't trust your hotel safe either. If, you, if you're worried about data on your computer, on your phone, that could compromise a third party that you've taken charge of and that you've made some kind of uh, reassurance to that third party that you will treat it with the due care that professionalism demands, then that device shouldn't be at rest out of your eye shot and, ear sight and, and earshot uh, when, you are, um, when, when, when you are abroad. And, and um, I'd also say, you know, you, you likely are a target. So for years, uh, when all the VIPs come into DEF CON, um, you know, last year I had about 30 of my investors coming in, and I told everyone I was just, assume your room is bugged. And, you know, they just thought that was, you know, an urban myth. Um, and we actually uh, brought a bug finder and found two bugs in our suite. And, um, and so, you know, this really does happen. And, um, and when you go to China, if you get upgraded to a suite, it's usually because that's where the really good spying equipment is. Um, also in your shower um, is often a place that they'll put bugs. Sometimes you can even see the ring um, if the shower fogs up, if they haven't done it right. Um, it's, are they putting bugs in your shower because they're pervs? No, this is where plate people go to have conversations because there's usually white noise. Uh, I, would, I would dispute or quibble with not backing up your phone to your computer. I think backing up to your phone, your phone to your computer is probably a good idea if for no other reason than it makes it easier for you to abandon your phone if you th feel like it's been compromised and still recover that data. But it, it should be your computer. Um, USB is a particularly worrisome one. It's one of those areas where it just feels like there's no good answer to it. The bad USB uh, uh, proof of concepts last year that were released showed that the, the firmware for USB uh, ports on your computer uh, is just not very well made, and this is true irrespective of the brand or operating system. It, it happens at a level below the operating system and can spread from computer to computer. It can spread by charger, also by USB stick, and if you were worried about um, uh, uh, breaching because you had a very uh, determined adversary, then plugging something, tr plugging untrusted USB devices into your computer, uh, devices that you didn't own, that you didn't walk into a store and pick up off the shelf at random, uh, is, is probably a, uh, well, definitely a very bad idea. And that includes charging, uh, charging phones. Uh, remember that, that the two threat models are the targeted attack and the opportunistic ones. So there's been a million Americans who've been targeted by uh, ransomware, where uh, opportunistically hackers uh, encrypt all the files on their computers after taking them over, uh, and then ask them for $500 worth of Bitcoin to get the key to unlock their files. Uh, and that's not because anyone's thinking about you personally. That's just an undirected attack. Well. You know, airports are full of people who have disposable income, at least sufficient to, to um, uh, you know, buy an, a plane ticket. And they're also full of public, not very well guarded USB chargers. Uh, you can buy a thing called a USB condom for your charger. That's a thing that takes your, your USB uh, port down from, it takes the data pin out. And so all that thing can do is pass voltage and not data. Um, that's, that's, it's a cheap and easy way to, uh, to kind of get around at least that risk. It doesn't help you when someone says, um, here, give me your USB stick with your presentation for this conference. Uh, we're just going to stick it in this laptop that 27 other USB sticks have been into today, and then we're going to hand it back to you so you can put it in your laptop. <laughs> um, that seems, you know, I, I, as a recovering AV tech, I, I'm sympathetic to people who say, no, 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 we don't want to plug your laptop into our AV system. We just want your presentation because we can't figure out how to get everybody's laptops to work with our AV system. But at least until bad USB has some kind of resolution, uh, I think plugging into shared USB devices for data purposes is a really bad idea. And charging without a USB condom is a very bad idea. 
So uh, we have about nine minutes left, so I'm going to talk about one more slide and then would love uh, to open it up to you all for questions. So start thinking about questions now while we talk about this last one. Uh, so uh, I, I do a lot of training with activists around the world, and especially with an activist, one of the main things you want to know is not only have you been bugged, but if so, by who and why. And so, um, you know, some of the times I'll purposely try to get bugs on my devices. Obviously, this is one of my burner devices, not my device with all the good content on it. Um, but a couple things, you know, am I being bugged is a question I often get. And so there's some telltale signs. Um, different bugs have all different levels. Um, but I would say if your battery usage is all of a sudden, um, take your, going through your battery a lot quicker or your phone gets hot, um, especially right after you've left your phone uh, through the airport or at your hotel, that's a great way to tell. Um, if you've got a bunch of, uh, of storage on your device and you can't tell um, where it's coming from, right? It's not your pictures, it's not your music, but uh, you're storing all this stuff on your device somewhere, that could be it. I think, um, you know, the other thing you can do is, um, is you know, be really careful with your hardware because a hardware level bug is really kind of the ultimate bug that you can have on your phone and it checks everything. Um, if, if this does happen, one of the key things you can, to, you can do is put like little snitch or there's a bunch of other free software you can put on your iPad connected to your device and watching the traffic going out um, may be a good way to tell. Um, also looking for signals around like in the room, um, looking for, for, this is not so much for your device, but a way to look for signals in your room or in your conference room. And then at that point, it's, it's uh, so now what? What do you do? Do you just get a new device and throw it away? Yeah, you do, but again, this is where uh, you, know, you get into, I would like to keep the device and start sending them to the wrong sources uh, or the wrong people, wrong information, messing it up. Um, it's a little hard to do with the computer, Corey, but I would say if someone's bugging you, misinformation mm -hmm. probably works a little better. Maybe, that might be so, yeah. Um, but also then, you know, bringing it in and, and having someone do forensics analysis on it and, and get the attribution of really who bugged you and then finding out the why. Because if they've done it once, they'll do it again. After the ritual destruction of the Guardian's laptops uh, in, in King's Cross by GCHQ, um, GCHQ d used the protocol that they use for destroying laptops in the field when they don't have access to the big shredder that you just drop the whole laptop in, which involves um, grinding out any component that they know how to bug, and then they left them behind with Alan Respiriger. And so Alan uploaded high-resolution photos of what the, what the logic boards on those MacBooks looked like after they'd, they'd been destroyed by GCHQ. And since then, there's been a group of analysts who've been going over them publicly, trying to figure out how you would bug these components, because there's a bunch of them that nobody had ever figured out how to bug before, kind of in the wild. And if GCHQ is grinding them off the board, it seems likely that they know something. So that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. All right, anyone have any questions for us? Yeah. Do you mind coming up to Mike? Because we are on camera here. Thanks. We're live all around the world. <laughs> um, my name's Jan. I'm from Oregon Public Broadcasting in Portland. And two questions. One, you know, when you're talking about erasing your identity, when all this information is out there, it makes it seem almost hopeless. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk to that a little bit. And then secondly, more philosophically, I've been doing digital media and broadcast convergence for a lot of years. And as part of that, we're encouraging journalists and our organization to be out there, you know, out there on phones, out there live from the field, out there through social media. And we've talked about risk, particularly with what happened in Virginia. And also, um, I've had friends in the Bay Area who've been attacked, and they're worried about that. But how do you balance the new technology and the need to be on all these platforms and to be personally identifiable with the privacy? It's a really hard question. I mean, I think that it's, it's especially hard when posed against the systems that require you to give a lot of personal information that then are not extremely well secured themselves. So it's not just that you have a reporter who's using Instagram and using a mobile phone in the field and so on and possibly 
riling up a troll who can do something even as trivial as swatting them, right? Calling a SWAT team and pretending to be in their house and saying, you know, there's a, there's a gunman in the house. This is a thing that's been done to women who speak out particularly on the internet, sometimes security researchers too, like Brian Krebs. And, um, and all of these institutions want you to use your home address and to give them your home address and to be able to check your home address and to be able to make copies of your driving license. And uh, my daughter's kung fu studio wants to make yeah. a copy of my driving license after I've given them a ton of money. And they couldn't articulate a reason. It was just sort of their, their best practice. And this gets at one of the biggest problems that we have with security, which is that it's, security is ultimately not an individual matter, right? So the, the information security involves individual hygiene, but also societal change. And so um, one of the roles that we have as journalists is to campaign and to campaign for better practices. And where we see bad privacy practices, I think that uh, calling them out and using the fact that you're a journalist to do it is actually a really good um, uh, best practice. So you know, in the US, you have a, a, a magic database that's supposed to be like all the pedophiles are on it. And before you go into a school, you have to let them make a photocopy of your driver's license so they can make sure you're not in the database that all the pedophiles have thoughtfully registered in. And um, when I do school visits, I'll often come into the school and there'll be a huge poster with my picture on it in the front hallway of the school. And they'll require a copy of my driving license to uh, identify me. And I'll say, but you, you do have this large picture of me in the hallway. This may suffice. And it never does. But I, I, I always make a point about it. We get there early. And I, and, I, and I say, I'd like to see your data retention policy. I'd like to know what third parties handle this data. And if I don't like the policy, then I ask for a variance in it. And so far, it's worked 100% of the time. I think that if you, if you pull out a notebook when someone says, I'm sorry, we don't have a data retention policy, but we're going to need a copy of your driver's license anyways, <laughs> and you write those words down, that it, it, can, it can at least open a conversation in a way that, that is hard to get at otherwise. It's really easy to feel uh, nihilistic about privacy. In particular, it's, it's easy to feel nihilistic when you start taking good steps, and then the people around you don't reciprocate, and, and you find yourself kind of alone in the field and feeling a bit tinfoil beanie, but also feeling like your privacy is, is being compromised by the people around you or tagging you on Facebook. Um, but the, I think the good news, the thing that gives me hope anyways, is that although we haven't reached peak surveillance, we've reached peak indifference to surveillance, right? Like the, the OPM and Ashley Madison, those weren't like the privacy quakes. Those were the tremors that precede the enormous, enormous breaches that are to come, right? The, the only surefire way not to breach information is not to collect it and not to retain it if you do collect it. We didn't talk about it before, but one of the things you should do if you have records after you've finished a story is that to the extent that you can, you should purge those records too because it's really the, the best way you can not leak things is to not have them. So what that means is if you're a privacy advocate, if you're worried about security, you can, you can pursue the strategy that we've pursued for the last 25 years over the kind of life and death of the term database nation, which is to go around and try and convince people that they should care, which so far hasn't paid a lot of dividends. But there's the other thing you can do, which is to, st is to be there ready with the story, the message, the how-to, the toolkit, the, the compassionate recovery, not I told you so, but the compassionate recovery tools for people when they breach. Because every day, every month, every year, you are going to know more people who are going to come to you and say, what do I do now? And that's the moment at which you say, well, you can either adopt good privacy hygiene or you can become a privacy nihilist. And I want to show you why good privacy hygiene gets you something that's worth doing and also gets something for your neighbors around you. And so we can, we can have in our back pocket the plan for the breach. In the same way that you know, you're, you're, uh, you've got a filing cabinet with obituaries for everyone important in Portland that, that get updated every couple of years so that you can slap it out as soon as somebody gets hit by a car, you need to have those in your, in your filing cabinet for the breaches too. What do you do now when there's a breach? And those need to be messages of hope. I like that breach response for journalists. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Just wondering, what do you guys think about uh, cloud storage like Dropbox and things like that? So I think that depending on your model, cloud storage makes some sense, right? If you're dealing with things that are not secret um, and that are bulky, having a server that has some authentication built into it 
probably works better than, than you know, anything else that you could ach achieve on your own without a good deal of technical expertise, right? So if you're transmitting photos to the newsroom, uh, that's probably the most effective thing that you have. For, for one thing, unlike, say, email or, or, or most of the other tools that you would normally use to send files around, they do file recovery. So they do download, uh, interrupted download recovery, upload recovery. So if you're uploading from the field um, and you've got a crappy, uh, you know, in again, out again link, you know, you might never get those files offloaded from your, from your machine uh, without having to go to some other location without a cloud provider that has done that smart stuff. Um, but I wouldn't use them for anything sensitive. And I would be very mindful of the fact that it's very hard to know a priori what's sensitive and what isn't, and also to distinguish the two, that wherever you can, it's better to have a, a, a more private solution. So there's a tool called OwnCloud. That's a free and open source software package that you would need your IT department to install and maintain. But it does most of what DropCloud does with good encryption and with, um, with privacy that is between you and your employer, if not you and the party that you're sending it to. So that's a pretty good um, uh, solution if you can talk someone in IT into doing it. Uh, another thing that um, uh, you can do uh, is you can treat those as repositories of encrypted data. So if you encrypt the data before you send it to the cloud, the, f the encrypted data itself is actually pretty well, uh, pretty, pretty private. Um, you know, you, you have to worry about signaling things like all of a sudden you start putting things up there that are encrypted where you never put things that were encrypted there before. So you might protect future you by making a practice of it now, um, which is a good idea anyways, because human beings are, are crappy lab techs and we're bad at automated ta automatable tasks. And one of the things that you'll probably do is forget to encrypt something that you meant to encrypt unless you encrypt everything as a matter of course. So encrypt everything and put it in Dropbox. And then Dropbox is just a commodity storage blob. But um, using its advanced synchronization features where it has to know what's in your files, that's something that requires that people who work at Dropbox know what's in your files too. Mm -hmm. And that we're getting back to how do I know, uh, how do I know my, my video from my home camera is safe? Well, we carefully vet the people who are allowed to look at it. Yeah. Uh, well, and my big problem with all the cloud services and the reason why I don't use any of them is because the privacy policy is the same on everyone. You're granting ownership and control of your data that you put into that to a service that makes money selling that. It's true. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think that if you're sending them encrypted blobs, then there's very little that they can do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that you should be on your radar is the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, uh, which a number of the largest tech companies in America uh, came out in support of yesterday. It's a very bad bill. Uh, um, Salesforce endorsed it, Apple endorsed it, Microsoft endorsed it, and a number of other big firms. It allows firms that collect private data from their customers or users to breach their own privacy policies in order to report suspicious activity to a wide variety of government agencies, a really farcically wide variety of government agencies, and it immunizes them from any liability for, for violating their own privacy policies. And it also uh, dangles a carrot in front of them which is um, it, participants in this program uh, are given help with their own security issues by, and, and their own um, business issues by getting information sharing from the American spy agencies about what their overseas competitors are doing that have been gleaned from, from the American intelligence apparatus's own overseas surveillance tools uh, or surveillance activities. This is a terrible, terrible idea in every conceivable way, right? We, we really want to create the incentives for firms to um, to, to, to do right here. If you're ever reporting on a breach, the two questions I think that would be really interesting to get answers to is how much cyber uh, risk coverage did your firm carry? Generally, it's, it's none or very little. And the other one is how much did the insurer price it at? Generally speaking, it's not enough. And I think one of the great levers we have to make firms better about this is by um, terrorizing insurance underwriters and risk adjusters and then, and also major institutional shareholders and big public businesses about how much a breach will cost them when it happens and, um, and how many bad practices there are uh, that are routine inside of firms uh, that could be easily remediated, including things like indefinitely retaining data because they think someday they might figure out a way to monetize it. That only works for so long as they can externalize the cost of dealing with the breach of our data to us. Uh, 
which is to say that when your data leaks, you have to clean up your life because they, they thought that someday they might figure out some way to do something with it. So forcing them to internalize those costs might get markets working in our service, but um, CISA and, and other cybersecurity bills like it, like CISPA, and there have been others introduced in the last couple of years, um, they all short circuit whatever market mechanisms we might have to make these firms be better actors. Sure. Talked about encryption. If you're using, uh, if you're using you know, cloud like Dropbox or mm -hmm. uh, I guess the Microsoft uh, service as well, what are the types of encryption? I don't know services or programs that you could use. I so, have a reporting team spread throughout uh, South America. Right. And we basically use Dropbox just out of convenience, but we right. report on on GP financial matters that are really sensitive. So GPG, uh, which is the free and open version of PGP, is kind of the gold standard for encrypting files. Uh, and encrypting messages. Um, it's hard to use, and it's hard to use for some intrinsic reasons, but also, generally speaking, the only people who had any um, understanding of why you would care about encryption were people who were already very technical. In the same way that before, like, um, PageMaker came along, everybody who wanted to do typesetting was already a typographer. And so the user interfaces of those old Ready, Set, Go and old layout programs made a lot of assumptions about your technical expertise going in. Um, as, the, as there was a wider interest in doing this very technical task, it turned out that things that we thought were intractably ta technical could actually be expressed in terms that lay people could understand. And also that lay people's understanding would come along, right? That now the kind of the primitives, the, the underlying principles of type are much more widely diffused than they ever were, not so that anyone who might want to do some type knows them, but anyone who want, might want to do some type knows someone who knows them. In the same way, Crypto tools are finally coming along. We've finally gotten to the point where people really, uh, of non-technical bent, really want to do this. So I'm on the board of a 501c3 called Simply Secure that does um, research and development into, into free and open source software front ends, uh, interfaces for all of these standard tools like OTR for chat, PGP and GPG for email, um, and, and so on, and trying to make them accessible and usable by normal humans. Uh, maybe not normal humans who are in Edward Snowden's position, but normal humans who are trying to resist either untargeted surveillance or, or kind of corporate espionage and not state-level espionage. Um, that, that, I think, is a, is a plausible target for us. For now, it's going to be hard to learn PGP. It's a pain in the ass. You'll have to do a lot of training with it. It sucks. I and, wish it was uh, better. Yeah, that's, that's why I uh, in, um, founded Wicker, because I wanted encryption that my three-year-old could use. I like Wicker a lot. I use it all the time. Um, but uh, uh, for doing whole file systems, uh, I don't know that I would use Wicker. Well, you Wicker, you can't, you can't use it right now for, yeah. to uh, encrypt up to Dropbox. So in that case, I would use yeah. GPG, too. Yeah. All right, well, I think we have Thank to uh, leave the much. room. Thank you all very much. Nice uh, to see you all. Grab a couple Faraday cages on your way out. Yep. <laughs>